Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Crest BD Talk BD event. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event, which is focused today on anxiety management. I'm Erin Mahalik. I'm a professor in the psychiatry department at the University of British Columbia. Um, I live on the Sunshine Coast, which is just outside of Vancouver, where one of my special non-academic skills is mushroom hunting. There are no mushrooms out at this time of the year, but I'm trying to pick up some foraging skills that I can use around the rest of the year. Let me pass over to Rob to introduce himself. Hi there, I'm uh, Dr. Rob Tarzel. I'm a psychiatrist, a nuclear medicine specialist, although that part of my work is less relevant today. I'm also a clinical assistant professor on the Faculty of Medicine at UBC, so Professor Mahalik outranks me, in fact. <laughs> Um, I've been in uh, the practice of psychiatry for, oh, coming up on 14 years, did my training at Dalhousie and my undergraduate medical degree at the University of Manitoba. So I've been uh, coast to coast in the pursuit of knowledge and the practice of uh, psychiatry. And it's a lot of fun to be here today. I've been a member of the, the Crest BD network. I don't even know how long now. It's over five years. Yeah. It might be heading towards 10, <laughs> which is really something. <laughs> I must make you a founding member almost. <laughs> I'm not a founder. No, no, I didn't get in on the ground floor. So I missed the big money uh, for those at the top <laughs> of the pyramid. Um, so <laughs> just, a, just a soldier toiling in the trenches. And to you, Victoria. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, um, my name is Victoria Maxwell, and uh, I am a founding member of Crest. Um, I missed the big money anyway, <laughs> even though I was in the founding member. And I think that was from, um, oh, 2007, I guess, was when it started. Uh, so being a peer researcher. And then my sort of full-time gig is being a keynote speaker about mental health and mental wellness and creativity. I do mental health coaching uh, and write for Psychology Today and um, The Mighty. And um, in my spare time, I run um, and uh, partially because I enjoy it and also because it's a really good mood stabilizer for me. Um, and it also keeps my marriage alive so that I actually don't go off the bend sometimes. Um, and uh, yeah, probably walking with my dog too and running with him. So Pedro, if you have- Pedro. Have, yeah, Pedro. So if you hear a bark, that's Pedro. Um, yeah, just to give you a heads up. Dr. Rob, you never gave us one of your uh, special non-academic abilities. Did you want to share oh. anything before we get going? Sorry, sorry, sorry. So um, my special non-academic abilities, uh, I have a private pilot license that I've had for a long time. It, it mostly sits unused, but once in a while I do get up in the sky. Um, I also like to run. I was out running earlier today. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful anxiety management tool for me. Yeah. Not to kind of let too many cats out of the bag at once, but that's cat number one. The advice is already flowing, and especially the high value stuff. <laughs> Exercise. Yeah. We are really excited to join you today uh, for the, what is the second in um, a series that we've launched during these times to support people with bipolar disorder and to support their supporters. Um, we held our first event um, two weeks ago, and we actually actually addressed quite a bit of stuff on anxiety management in that first Talk BD event. Um, after we finished it, we ran some consultation polls on Facebook and Twitter, and we asked our Crest BD community what they wanted to hear more of, um, and overwhelmingly what we heard was they wanted to hear, you wanted to hear more on anxiety management and get a deeper dive into that. So that's what we're doing today. Um, just briefly, I'll tell you that Crest BD is um, we're a research group. It stands for the Collaborative Research Team to study psychosocial issues in bipolar disorder. We focus on quality of life and psychosocial treatments in the condition and really try and create new ways for people um, with lived experience of bipolar disorder to engage in research in a different way. Um, a few things on technical stuff as well that we should cover. Um, I see that there are a lot of you, welcome, joining us from 
across the country and beyond today via Zoom. Uh, the rest of you will either be joining us through live stream to our Facebook or viewing um, this, uh, this recording afterwards. Uh, we'll be going into a question and answer session after we've had um, some banter and chit chat and tips and tools from Victoria and Rob. Um, we won't be opening up for audio questions though. Um, we'll be taking the questions either through Facebook um, or in the Zoom Q&A box. So you can use the anonymous tab um, to enter your questions in there. And we've also been doing a survey um, over the last few days via our website. So we've had quite a few questions come in already in advance of this meeting. So we will do our best to get through those. Um, okay, I think that was it for kind of housekeeping stuff. So I will pass over to you guys. All right. Where shall we start, Ms. Maxwell? Well, I'm thinking that uh, probably just giving an idea of what anxiety is, especially around these times, because I think probably everybody's been feeling some kind of stress or anxiety, but I think it's also mm. different in terms of what it means for bipolar disorder uh, mm. when it comes with anxiety and how it becomes sort of clinical, like when you guys get involved. Right, right, right. <laughs> and I, I did want to mention, because I forgot early on that I live with bipolar disorder and generalized anxiety disorder and uh, psychosis. And so I sort of got a triple threat going on, uh, not the dancing, singing, acting thing, but you know, so <laughs> anyway, so I'll let Rob take it from there. But she can dance, sing, and act, so. Not sing, cool. but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So anxiety is an experience that just about everybody has. And essentially it's um, when it's running, functioning normally, it's a way that we have responding to threats. And the paradigm example would be fear. And that could be you're walking down the street, it's dark, there's a menacing figure on the other side of the street starts crossing towards you. And you probably notice a number of reactions happening inside your body, right? So your heart starts pounding, uh, your breathing gets faster, um, you start to, you get really sharply focused on the source of the threat, and you may or may not notice that uh, you maybe feel lightheaded to some degree, and you have an urge, like a sudden surge of energy, and it wants to do something. And it usually that what it wants to do is focus towards that threat, and it's either move toward and confront or book it and get out of there. And that's part of the, the, the fight or flight response. Anxiety would be the activation of that response in the absence of a discrete uh, threat. So this would be um, like say generalized anxiety disorder, which you mentioned, which is kind of um, a hard to kind of localize kind of fear of everything. Um, Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just about anything can switch that on or nothing at all can switch it on. And anxiety often has two components. So there's the cognitive component, which is anxious thoughts, which are generally kind of, it's kind of this prediction market that starts bubbling up in your brain. And they're all doom predictions like, ah, oh, well, what if this goes bad? Or what if um, I drive the car off a cliff? Or what if I crash into a tree? Or um, what if I don't get a paycheck this month? Or what if I open the envelope, the paycheck comes in and there's nothing in there and on, on, you know, it can literally attach to anything. Yeah. And then there's the somatic component, which I already described, which is that preparedness to fight or flight, except there's nothing there to fight or run from. So it's a really um, unpleasant sensation, especially when there's no way to resolve it. Um, and in the context of COVID-19, there are all sorts of people who maybe have never, you know, I've, I've heard this story, people who've never really experienced anxiety in their lives, those lucky devils, and are sort of saying, well, what are these, what are these feelings I'm having in my body when I think about this virus? Well, I, I think I know. Um, and then there's a few um, folks on the other end of the spectrum who are just kind of plagued with anxiety, maybe all the way to the level of panic, and they're suddenly finding they're doing a lot better because they're just suddenly organizing and coping and they wake up in the morning and they're like, oh, the bad thing happened. I, I guess I can be okay now. But then there's all the rest of us in the middle where we have some degree of activation of this system that wants to fight or wants to run 
but there's nothing to fight and there's nowhere to run. And it's just, it's sort of like the car is in neutral, the engine is redlining. Ah, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And so a lot of people have noticed they're less productive. A lot of people have noticed that they're having trouble sleeping. A lot of people have noticed that they are having worries, sort of those kind of those doom prediction markets in their minds. You know, what if I get this illness? What if I am one of the people that dies? What if I pass it on to somebody I love? Um, you know, there's, there's just an infinite number of questions that arise from that. So that's kind of, a, I guess, a snapshot summary of, of anxiety. And, and Rob, Rob and I just wanted to ask, and Rob, you were saying how when often we get triggered into these states, then it can actually, it could be that we are, we know we're worried about COVID or something, or that uh, my husband's laid off or, or something. Mm -hmm. And then if you naturally are already sort of have a tendency to anxiety, uh, particularly with bipolar disorder, then it can attach to everything. So then right. things that you weren't normally worried about can feel you can have anxious thoughts about. So that's it right. Yeah. Could be about maybe like for myself recently, um, I'm usually quite confident in my work and my anxiety was actually high before uh, COVID even happened, but it, it started to wane and then COVID happened and it went up a bit, went down and then it went up again. And then when it did, it uh, attached to sort of a lack of confidence around work. And so, you know, I just noticed that my, my lens is colored not only by, um, it, it's like out of proportion and disproportionate to what I normally, how I would normally react. So, so yeah, so the anxiety can definitely generalize right. even further, or it can start to get a, accompanied by obsessions, which is the that that repetitive thought again and again and again and again. I'm gonna I'm gonna get contaminated by this virus. This virus is on every surface. I can't touch anything. Uh, even the air I breathe is potentially risky and dangerous. Uh, or it can yeah it can manifest in, in really weird things. Like say somebody who is um, scared of uh, scared of spiders. Well now maybe they're like scared of spiders and birds. And what is what the heck has that got to do <laughs> with yeah. the, with the virus? Right? Well maybe nothing at all. But this yeah. stuff all it, it kind of uh, it kind of goes all sorts of different directions. It's like, what do you do when the laundry basket's full? Well, it just spills out onto the floor and that's not necessarily a calculated process. Right, right. And so what what are some of the things that you um, uh, recommend around managing? Because I've been in that state before uh, and when there's both that really heightened anxiety physiologically as well as the psych psychologically. I've got my own sort of coping tools, but I'm wondering sort of what your thoughts around that are particularly yeah. if it's, and I don't know if it's very different with bipolar disorder. You know, it turns out it's not that much different. Um, anxiety is, it, well, it's really common in bipolar disorder, in the manic phase, in the depressed phase, and in the level mood phase. So anxiety and bipolar disorder are, are unfortunately kind of close companions. And I'm sure a lot of folks with bipolar disorder would quickly endorse that. Um, or, or folks with like unipolar kind of major depression, you know, anxiety just kind of seems to stalk individuals with mood disorders. And now it's stalking all sorts of, even the normies, the neurotypicals are out there getting anxious. And it's yeah. sort of like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now you get a taste of my life. I know, um, now you know what it's like, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the, the first, I think, coping strategy is to kind of say, yes, this is happening. So to just sort of be honest with yourself and say, you know, actually I am kind of anxious or a lot anxious or just a little or whatever, you know, whatever degree, because there's, there's a, it's, a, it's a spectrum of anxiety. And then um, after you've accepted it, then you can stop being anxious about your anxiety because that's, that's where you can really tie yourself into knots where like, oh, oh my God, what's happening? I'm, I'm not as productive and I, I can't sleep. And uh, what does this mean? And then you've got anxiety about anxiety and that just increases the burden, right? So you can kind of just, just by acknowledging that this is happening and that it's not something at the moment that you have much control over, that surprisingly can be a kind of a liberating experience. Um, and that may be a practice or a work of kind of re-acknowledging and re-acknowledging because the... 
the global event hasn't gone away. And every morning we wake up and it's sort of like, you know, well, you sweep the leaves off the porch, you re-acknowledge that you're having anxiety, maybe extra anxiety because of what's going on out in the world these days. Um, in terms of self-coping strategies that are, are, are pretty straightforward, well, um, since you want to fight and you want to run, the, there are these kind of physical directed activities. Well, uh, maybe you maybe you can do do physical activities yourself to kind of find ways to discharge this anxiety. Because the nice thing of, about anxiety, more or less, is it's it's kind of a wave like process. Sometimes those waves are really long, but anxiety generally it starts to build. It hits a peak and it, then it starts to crest and it sort of levels off and you get a break until the next wave comes. When you have that wave, you can kind of move through it quickly with some kind of a physical discharge, right? And then that, that's got to be something you kind of can figure out yourself. Is that a speed bag? Is that a heavy bag? Is that uh, raking the yard? Um, is that a brisk walk? Is that sprinting? Um, and, and that really kind of comes down to whatever you kind of feel like is going to burn that anxiety off, depending kind of where it resides in your body. A lot of people feel that anxiety in their chest, right? Because there's that part that that's the sort of the fight part. And then there's a lot of folks that just kind of jumpy, jumpy legs, right? Well, that's the flea, flea part. So follow the cues, be aware of the cues in your body and follow those as kind of a first line. Um, and then in terms of say handling, handling worries, you know, a very basic level, um, is to try to kind of call on or rally that part of you. There's always that little voice in there that is able to kind of latch on to what's, what's reasonable or rational. And that voice can just start asking questions like, well, um, is it really the case that if I get this virus, I'll die. I mean, you know, maybe, um, maybe not though. And it can, you can kind of help to kind of take these catastrophic level thoughts and deflate them to an appropriate level of urgency and concern, you know, not to a level where you're dismissing it. And then you're like licking all the ham at Safeway, but maybe to a level where you're like, you know, I, I, I can go outside. Uh, I can stay away from people, I can wash my hands a lot, and I can still move about in the world and get the things done that I need to do. So those would be sort of the, the sort of the frontline thing. So acknowledge it, physical exercise to kind of burn it, burn off the waves, and then cognitively confront it. Yeah. yeah, and I can speak to all of those is that those are the things that I am like doubling down on right now. Um, exercise in particular, like I usually wake up with a feeling of doom and I'm going through a depressive phase right now with anxiety. And I, um, I guess, and this is probably more uh, apt for um, depression, but what also I know has helped me is to really write down, not just have a routine, but a schedule so that I make it realistic, but I commit to someone uh, that, okay, so I'm going to get up at a certain time, I'm going to go to bed at a certain time, and I'm going to go for a run between this time and this time, and I'll work between this time and this time, just so that I can um, have a sense, some sense of control over the things that I can't control. So and one of those things for me is how I'm actually experiencing myself in my body. So there's a lot of times where you're talking about that wave. Mm -hmm. The wave for me is definitely going up and it's not always going back down to baseline. It's sometimes just staying at a low level, low grade mm -hmm. anxiety, which is really not pleasant, but I've gotten used to it. And then sometimes, and then after I run, it's like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. And that lasts for a while and then it comes back. And that's when I do the re-acknowledging, oh, I'm anxious, okay. <laughs> And, uh, and doing the whole sort of um, shrinking the, the catastrophizing. Uh, and, and sometimes that's about problem solving. So my anxiety will latch on to, oh my gosh, I've got this work project. I'm totally incompetent. I, I don't know how to do it. Uh, you know, and I just, you know, it's like me having a, my finger in an electric socket or something. And, and then if I'm able to just do a tiny step and write you know, write out uh, what are the steps I need to take and do that one tiny bit at a time and only what I need to do. So instead, you know, it's, it's really, it's basic stuff about not biting off more than you can chew, 
but when I'm anxious, it's hard to, to focus and to think mm. clearly. Mm. So, so it's those small reminders. All right. Did you want to go to questions, um, Aaron? There are so many questions coming in. Do you want to, are you ready to dive into some of those? I'm good. <laughs> I think Rob is, yeah. I've got a science officer shirt on here, I'm ready. <laughs> Okay, let me see if I can do this. I've got expertise in qualitative research, so I'm going to try and do them thematically for you. They'll probably oh. crash and burn, but these, these two are related. Uh, the first, first person asks, we were on vacation for a month and then completed 14 days of isolation. On my first day out on the street, I was overwhelmed and now feel anxious about going back out. Mm. What can I do to help my anxiety? Wait, wait, there's one more, okay. which is similar in nature. Um, my family and I left Canada for holidays just before the pandemic struck. Within days, the gravity of it, it was blown out of control. I had anxiety and sleepless nights, watching the news, fearing returning home. Now that this person's home, uh, self-isolating, getting groceries delivered, only going out to walk the dog, I feel 100% safe. I want to just stay at home, but that's not going to be feasible or realist realistic potentially. Right. right. How do I deal with my fear and anxiety? about going back out there. Okay, yeah, so agoraphobia is kind of a, a theme there, right? And I think we're probably feeling a little bit, I mean, I feel a little bit of that myself when I'm kind of, when I open that door and I'm stepping out into the world to, uh, to kind of go for a run or, or go for anything. And I think- um, Can you define that for us, agoraphobia? Oh yeah, so agoraphobia, you know, agoraphobia, I mean, literally it's like, you know, uh, a fear of the agora or the marketplace, or, you know, if, if, if if, uh, if the ancient Greek philosophers were alive now, they'd say it's like a fear of malls. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, basically agoraphobia, it's that fear of going out into the world and that feeling of, you know, and you avoid that by staying home and you associate safety with home, uh, which I think all of us do. I think that's pretty natural, but where it becomes functionally impairing is when, well, you kind of need to go outside and so the way that we tackle any phobia is we start with the things that we can do and work our way towards the things we can't do. So if going outside is overwhelmingly terrifying, well, don't aim to go outside. Maybe you just aim to stand in your doorway. If that's too terrifying, maybe you just kind of open the door and step back and see if you can just tolerate some kind of communication between the outer and the inner world. And if that's too frightening, then I want you, you know, you can imagine what it would be like to open the door. Um, often these things start as imagined exercises and you kind of note the anxiety surging in your body and you just stay with it and stay with it and stay with it. But, you know, the, the key to treating a phobia is to kind of progressively expose yourself to the thing that scares you until it becomes boring. And so there was a time in your life not that long ago where going outside was just part of your daily routine, part of your world. So you can get back there again, and it's that process of breaking it off into chunks. You know, we call it a, an exposure ladder. So start with the thing you can do and do that until that's boring, and then go up to the next step and do that until it's boring, and then the next step and do that until it's boring. And that's really kind of the fastest path. Um, overwhelming exposure can work, um, and it's quicker, but it's not the kindest uh, approach though, is it? It's, it's not kind. <laughs> we were talking think, a lot about self-compassion and kindness to ourselves in the yeah. last meeting we had. I don't think that's the kindest one. And, and the, the paradox of that is if you bail before you've desensitized, you may find you have even more avoidance and greater levels of fear because you were just out there just drowning in terror. And then you went back into your house, right? So don't do that. It's think of it like swimming lessons. When you started swimming lessons, you didn't start at the deep end of the pool unless you had one of those cruel uncles, right? You started in the shallow end. Yeah. So to get reacclimatized to the outer world, start in the shallow end. Yeah. Does that resonate with you, Victoria? It does, except I think part of it is that when it doesn't feel like it's um, overwhelming or it, to the point of agoraphobia, but more where it's it just, I guess, and maybe this is it, is where it, it triggers my anxiety. And I know I have to go, I'm still capable of going out. So in that case, 
um, I guess what you're saying is, because what I would do uh, and what I have been doing, if I'm feeling it, is doing what feels safe, but also it's that edge of when I am experiencing anxiety and I find out that I survive. So I would get into my car and, and if I can, you know, if I can go with a pr like my husband where we're, we're together, so it's not inappropriate in terms of social distancing, I, I have a supportive person go with me in the car to the grocery store. And so maybe I don't go into the grocery store. I mean, I, I've been okay with doing that, but he goes in and I stay in the car. And so it's that, I guess that's still exposure. It's uh, for me, it's been when I'm starting to feel just insecure and unsafe, um, I'm, I'm having to learn to be comfortable with these really distressing physiological um, sensations. Right. And, that, and that's to me when mindfulness comes in, it's, it's, I, I don't like that as an answer because it means that I can't get rid of these fucking feelings, <laughs> sensations. Did you just say that? <laughs> you said that. Um, we just lost our G rating. That's right. I said fricking. I didn't say anything else. Oh, that wasn't what I heard. <laughs> what you no, 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 no. I said, I said, like, yes, no, I didn't say that word. Okay. Don't say that. No, I, don't say I didn't. That. Let's go to an instant poll. <laughs> What did Victoria say? Oh my gosh, no, I know. Yeah. Man, I thought you were like cheering me on for the fact that I gave some really good information. Uh, have you not noticed? I, I've noticed personally I'm swearing a lot more these days than pretty and I'm okay with that. I'm practicing self-compassion about my- um, So yeah, so anyway, I could go on and on about mindfulness and sometimes it's mindfulness and you could throw out, you know, when things are so overwhelming. I, I listened to this great podcast by Tara, Tara Brack, and she said, you know, when things are really overwhelming, that's not a time to sit on the cushion and be mindful of this. That's time to take a break. It's time mm -hmm. to call a friend. It's time to listen to music. It's time to do some self-soothing. So, but I, I think we have a lot of questions and I want to make sure we have time for them all. Good point though, about the, the complete extinguishing of anxiety it just may not be a realistic prospect, Yeah. but it, draining a lot of it and being able to function that's that's quite a realistic prospect yeah and yeah. that for now might be good enough to function yeah. and and so for me that's why having sort of a, a, a sort of a scaffolding of what my day looks like of some tasks and just assume that I'm going to be anxious assume that I'm going to be depressed be as kind to myself as I can and put one step in front of the other while I'm doing these tasks and mm -hmm. tasks that are ideally value-based. So, you know, watching four episodes of Law and Order in a row, I is you know, I, I don't mind, I think fun is good. It's part of my value system, but avoidance I'm not really thrilled with. So, so I try to cut it down to like two, which I did yesterday. <laughs> bum, bum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next bum, question. Bum, bum, bum. Singing and dancing. Is it normal to wake up in abject terror and uh, not be able to pinpoint the reason for that? This actually started before COVID-19, this per person says, before the stay at home orders, but it's really gotten worse with the surrealism of what is happening in the world. Well, I can definitely resonate with that surreality. I mean, um, uh, it's springtime now, right? And I was out last night. I go out for walks at night because there's just less people on the seawall. Uh, and I don't really feel like it's spring. I don't feel like I'm taking a walk in the spring. I feel like an alien astronaut just doing observations of this world that I find myself in. Um, so I can relate, and I think a lot of people can relate to some degree of dissociation. And dissociation is a partial loss of contact with reality when that reality being fully in touch with it's too overwhelming too frightening too terrifying it's like a kind of a cutoff switch or a dial that we can tap into and again a lot of the normies are kind of telling me i feel like i'm in a dream i don't know who i am or i suddenly realize what time it is what's going on and I'm, well, that's dissociation friend and um they're they're uh and you know, a lot of people kind of get the idea that you, you, you've got these kind of circuit breakers in your mind that will pop if um, something is too much. And uh, what's okay though, is they know they'll, they'll reset and you'll, you'll reconnect. The, that experience of terror in the morning though, that sounds like really you know, deeply unpleasant. And I wouldn't 
go so far as to say you asked is that normal you know i wouldn't say um you know it's certainly part of the human experience but it I sounds like it. a i've experienced year. it <laughs> <laughs> so so there are only maybe two of us but i think there's more but i can say that i've experienced it <laughs> and, uh, yeah. ones, so, uh, <laughs> um, i mean the, the good news is that that's that's something that is um, worth discussing with a, you know, a physician or a nurse practitioner or a psychologist or therapist or, you know, pick whoever helps you. Is it your rabbi? I don't know. Um, but that's not something that you need to bear alone. And it's something that can be targeted with treatment. Good answers. Thank you. Moving on to the next one. I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder type one. I recently have noticed my heart racing, shortness of breath, anxiety. I'm trying to avoid triggers like a hmm, certain politician, but I can't avoid my daughter's need to do homework. And we learned that she's been diagnosed with ADHD. My question is how do I best manage myself when trying to get my daughter to focus on her homework? Mm, good question. Uh, I know I think it's it's okay to recognize that there there are many there there are just limits there there are just kind of limits to what you can do as a human being and um, to it, it, this is this might be very hard to hear there are limits to your momishness <laughs> to where you can go with that and that's okay right um, the the it's you know it's true that there's a lot of um, inherited relationship between attentional disorders and mood disorders. So we find that individuals with mood disorders in the family, there might be other individuals with mood disorders or attentional disorders. And one of the defining features of bipolar disorder is distractibility. And a lot of folks with bipolar disorder also have ADHD that gets only gets discovered once the mood symptoms have settled enough. And then it's still like, you know, I just can't read a paragraph in a magazine. What's this all about? Mm -hmm. And they just assume, well, that's just my bipolar, right? Well, maybe not, right? Maybe you have distractibility that can also be treated and improve your, your quality of life. So if you're at a point where you're in a state of panic, and that, that almost sounds like, you know, that, that racing heart and the rapid breath, this is now, this is kind of edging towards a panic attack, or it's in that, in that range. It's pretty hard to be sort of rational and functional when it essentially feels like your head's being held underwater by a big burly man, right? And that's kind of the same reaction. You would get that same reaction in your body if that was happening to you. So you're having the reaction without having to even have that really terrible stimulus or input. And so um, in terms of your, your daughter, whether or not she's getting her homework done, you know, maybe it's okay to let that slide a bit, especially, especially now. Um, I'm not really sure how school years are winding out for a lot of kids at different ages. I think a lot of virtual schools are just finally coming back online. I think a, a lot of teachers, schools, school boards are cutting everybody a lot of slack, right? We're all going to advance to the next year. We're going to work it out. If you happen to not learn complex fractions this year, <laughs> you'll get it. You'll get it by the time you need it. Did you um, ever get them, Victoria? Did you get <laughs> complex fractions? I never actually got those. As <laughs> impinged on my career. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't remember. And I don't remember ever having to use them after, after I graduated. <laughs> so that's the thing, right? Um, yeah. And, and one of the things that I would say, too, is that... Um, to get support for yourself um, and at the same time you want something to address the acute situation so i think lowering expectations totally okay like it's okay like because you're not gonna with knowing that your daughter now has a diagnosis you're not expecting her to be able to do these equations like in one two three right away and understand it and so the kind of um realistic expectations that you'd have for her and the kind of compassion that you'd have for her, uh, apply that to yourself mm -hmm. first. Um, and the two kinds of support I would, I, I guess would be three, would be um, there's online support groups. Um, if you're wanting to just be with other individuals who are experiencing, whether it's anxiety or bipolar disorder, and I can probably put something in the uh, chat um, you can go to uh, Support Group Central, and that's a fairly reputable one. 
they're usually based in the states or somewhere in North America, but you can still um, you can still actually uh, join. Um, and there's no cost for them. Sometimes there's a cost like a five dollar contribution or something, but it's optional. Um, and they have them for a whole bunch of different things. All online support groups. Uh, online support. Yeah. Groups. Yeah. And so you could go to the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance. Yeah. They have online support groups or supportgroupcentral.com, which has a whole variety of them. Um, and the other thing for me when I'm in that sort of panicky state is um, really doing some uh, grounding and belly breathing. So um, finding some kind of breathing exercise that might work for you. It, it, I think there's so many out there that it really varies. Um, but one of the important things is, is that when you're doing these breathing exercises, if it's box breathing or something, it's important to know how to breathe, which is really that diaphragmatic breathing. So right down into your belly um, and ideally practicing it when you're not feeling anxious mm -hmm. so that you get a sense of mastery so that you get a sense of how it can calm you down. And so if you're at a 10 of anxiety, so when I'm doing it and I'm at a, like a 9.8 of anxiety and I've practiced the belly breathing other times, I may only get down to a seven, but that's a lot more comfortable than the 9.8, trust me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so those are sort of the, the support groups, lowering uh, expectations with compassion and then um, looking at some um, breathing exercises. And if you like, it sounds like it's a relatively recent diagnosis. Uh, and if you like comedy, get on YouTube and find Maria Bamford, who is a bipolar comedian of uh, the, the first order. And her her, her latest show uh, <laughs> talks about this idea of lowering expectations. That's called Weakness is the Brand. And yeah, get yeah. your hands on that and watch that and enjoy yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> we will find the link for that and put that in the chat for yeah. you. Awesome. <laughs> You know, Victoria, when you were describing overall, when I look back on this webinar we've done together, much of the self-management or coping strategies you're describing for anxiety aren't cognitive. They're like physiological breaks or doing something different or behaviorally being different. You know, is that a general approach that you think works better or are, there, are you trying to challenge the way you're thinking at the same time? Yeah, I guess I do both. I guess I, I've done uh, CBT, um, cognitive behavioral therapy before. And the only thing that I found is that if I'm in um, a physiological state, I sometimes it, it sort of, and I don't know, Rob, if you can talk to this, but it supersedes any of my thinking. Like, I don't really know what my thoughts are. They just seem to be rapid fire. It's just fear, 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 fear. And um, so if it's a more, uh, and then if I can slow my uh, body down, um, I will take a look at um, the thoughts. And so being able to get myself out of the sort of the, the lizard brain and being able to just say, so I'm feeling afraid and what am I thinking? And that tends to get me sort of outside of the struggle a bit and outside of the fear. Um, the issue for me when I was doing by, um, uh, CBT was that I, it was like whack-a-mole. So, you know, I just keep having all these different thoughts come up. And so it's, it's sort of a combination of being able to know what thoughts I need to challenge. So if I have a thought that, oh, I'm never going to be able to work again, or my, my career is done or something like that, you know, it's worth challenging that, um, but if it keeps coming up and up and sort of that rumination or obsession, that's when sometimes mindfulness or even distraction, like I've put in, you know, crossword puzzles are part of my coping skills and reading a really good pulp fiction book is, is part of it. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Rob, around that? Cause I think the cognitive part is really important because to get out of the, the that reptilian brain into the, sort yeah. of the frontal lobe. Right, right, yeah. Um, I mean, if you want to look at it sort of from an evolutionary perspective, um, anxiety uh, and activation of our sympathetic nervous system is a much more ancient and hardwired system than cognition, language, thought, which are kind of later additions. And ideally, we, we like it when those parts are in charge, because that's when we're reasonable and rational and we're getting things done in productive ways. 
But the reality is that they're fairly easily derailed. And if the train is off the track, it's not much, there's not much use being up in the engine tweaking the, all right, let's make the train go now. No, <laughs> we got to get the train back up on the track first. So that starts with the, the physical interventions. And if that's even not possible, then, you know, there's medication um, that, that, that can really help. And that's where you want to really be connected with your prescriber uh, looking at, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of a panic attack or I feel one coming and there's nothing I can do at this stage. I don't have these skills. How do I prevent this from, from happening? And do not be afraid to, to let your prescriber know that you're overwhelmed. No uh, pun intended, right? What's that? <laughs> no pun intended. Don't be afraid to. Don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's really a bit hard to do. Be afraid and ask for some help. <laughs> yeah, ask for some help. Ask for some help because, um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a big dessert tofu made of chemicals and it talks with itself with chemicals. And what we can do is we can add chemicals to kind of, um, change, to shift those internal conversations a little bit and kind of get you, glue you back to the world. And, and I can speak for that uh, very personally, because it took me a long time to accept that I needed to take medication. I was all about doing it the natural way. And um, lavender just doesn't do it, <laughs> you know. Essential oils just wasn't hitting it. Reiki wasn't doing it. Um, and uh, and then so I've been on medication for bipolar disorder for for many many years. And um, even and then when I uh, am managing really well, you know, uh, there were times where I thought, oh, I can decrease it. I tried. It, it doesn't work for me. And the way that I describe it is what you said, Rob, is that it's, it's like, I, I equate it to my brain for whatever reason, either doesn't produce enough of the kind of chemicals that I need to maintain a really well-balanced um, mood, or it, I, it doesn't absorb them the same way or something like what, whatever it is, something's just not working. Now, there's, there may be causes that I can, or things I can do to amp that up um, outside of pharmaceuticals, but it may not be enough. And when it's enough, I need to really just allow myself to say, hey, this is, this is medicine for me, and this is, um, it, and is it helping? And what I find is that if I ask, is it helping? That is probably the best question. Is it improving my quality of life? Mm. Um, and I think particularly, and, and it's, I think it's a bit different when you're talking about medication for anxiety, sometimes if there, um, if there's properties that can be addictive. So I'm really cognizant, uh, cognizant of that, but there's other, there's certain medications I know of that, that aren't, that don't have those addictive properties. And, yeah. um, I think it's just, uh, looking at what's, uh, you know, the cost benefit. Um, and it could be for a time limited period or, or not, but either way, it's about letting go of that self-judgment. Cause I, I, yeah. I still have that judgment and I have to sort of be as kind to myself as possible when that happens. And, uh, my favorite story about natural medications, you know, at the, the big bang, as we all know, that was when suddenly, you know, the universe kind of created all this hydrogen and there was helium, but you know what the third element in the big bang was lithium. <laughs> Lithium has been present since the beginning of the universe. It is 13.4 billion years old. It is our oldest natural remedy. It knew that there were going to be people with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's preparing it's, for the fact that we need to take care of these people. They're going to be some of our best intellectual people. Right. But yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's Lithium, it's even older than lavender. Wow, wow. Older than trees, older than the earth. <laughs> yeah. Older than the solar system. Wow, that's amazing. I had a follow-up question on the pharmacology piece there. So Victoria, you said that um, you were talking about the addictive potential of some, some medications for anxiety. Somebody on the line wanted to know if there were um, medications other than the benzodiazepine class specifically, it's a question for you, Rob, probably, uh, that could be used for anxiety that don't have addictive potential that can, somebody could be considering, you know, as a, as a treatment for these times for now. Yeah. So, I mean, our, our number one uh, medication treatments for anxiety disorders are the SSRIs. Um, of course, those have to be managed very carefully in the setting of bipolar disorder because SSRIs can quite famously activate mania. 
Yeah, and those, um, are, those are antidepressants, correct? Yeah, that's right. The, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, that class of antidepressants. Um, also, there are some individuals who less commonly, but, you know, optimizing mood stabilizers can be a way of reducing anxiety. So getting lithium into the therapeutic range or to the higher end of the therapeutic range or, or Epivalve. And there's work now on other um, anti uh, or mood stabilizing anticonvulsant type drugs. There's some work with um, gabapentin. Uh, there's some work with Lyrica. So there's 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 a lot of options out there that have varying degrees of evidence that can be explored. And there is a role for benzodiazepines that can be they can be used they can be prescribed safely. Um, and in the right setting, they can be even it, having the availability of a benzodiazepine, even if you're not using it all the time, but having the availability of using it, say, to abort a panic attack or severe anxiety, mm -hmm. that can be something that can be safely managed for years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I've been prescribed, well, I'm on an SSRI, um, mood stabilizer, and um, also have, but I don't use as uh, clonazepam, I guess it's a benzo. And so I, I and, and, and knowing that I have it gives me some sense of safety. Like I'm sort of going, right, okay, so if things get really bad, I can take half a tablet, that's all I need, that's good, <laughs> good. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and, and, that's, and that helps to sort of modulate things. Time for one more question, I think. An interesting one. Um, this person talks about going into the grocery store right now and it feeling like it's going, they're going into battle, so many landmines. Is it possible to develop other psychological disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder, even although you never had it before COVID-19? This is something that we don't know. We've never had a global pandemic, so we don't really have um, much of an idea of what we might expect in terms of the psychiatric pandemic wave once the, the biological wave settles, but it's certainly something that I wonder about. Uh, individuals who develop a level of concern around contamination, will that slide over into an obsession about contamination and will that become accompanied by compulsive behaviors to manage the obsession? Like, you know, we're, we're all supposed to be washing our hands quite a lot and very conscientious about this and we should be mindful of um, respiratory droplets and so forth and mindful of contamination of packaging and so forth. Um, at what point does that edge over into, okay, I can't switch this off now, even though there's not a plausible or realistic threat. Um, I certainly think that's a potential pathway into a disorder. Uh, another one I wonder about, you know, that, that people are already describing is that, that agoraphobia phenomenon. Well, and then on, the, on the flip side, what about claustrophobia? How many of us are going to be comfortable walking into a movie theater in four or five months time once this is all settled? It's something that I'll be like wondering about as I'm sitting in between all sorts of um, huffing and puffing co-patrons um, hmm. busily munching on popcorn and soda. So I can certainly, you know, I couldn't give you figures for that. It's really just kind of hunches and I haven't looked, I mean, there certainly have been outbreaks in other areas, right? I don't want to say that this is the first ever disease outbreak because that, that would be monumentally false. We've had lots and lots of things like different flu epidemics. Uh, and I haven't investigated that data to see what the psychiatric consequences were, but it wouldn't surprise me to find that there are new onset anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsion, new phobias, uh, and uh, triggering or exacerbation of existing mood disorders as well. And then of course, um, probably exacerbation of psychotic disorders. Mm -hmm. So can you um, round off on a slightly less bleak note, the pair of you? <laughs> Sure. Uh, Before we go into some slides, just to, uh, we are going to provide you with some other resources and tools. And but before I get into those kind of closing slides, I'd like for you both to do a couple of reflections on the conversation that we had, the questions that we had, um, and really to thank the participants for those excellent, excellent array of questions that were really on target. Um, Indeed. So I'll give you both a couple more minutes or a minute or two each, and then we'll 
we'll go into some closing. My, my positive reflection would be that uh, time and time again in human history, in times of great crisis, what we find is the way that humans react is we become more cooperative, we become more pro-social, and there are opportunities here to examine our habitual ways of having, of, of doing things, of, of, of doing the economy, of doing politics. And it's kind of all this stuff sort of softens up a little bit. And it's an opportunity for things to crystallize in new ways. Mm -hmm. And it remains to be seen what that's gonna be like, but poll data uh, in Canada and the US as well shows that uh, for the first time in a while, you know, we had been in a really polarized place politically until not too long ago. <laughs> I don't think that's a surprise to anyone, but now poll after poll is showing that Canadians are feeling like we have more in common than we do differently. More people are, are saying, you know, I think the government is handling this the right way. I think the, co the country is moving in the right direction. I think we're taking the steps we need to take to get through this crisis. And so there's this sense of collective altruism that has that I've, it's something I've noticed. And it's something that I feel when I'm out in the street. I'm like, I'm like waving at strangers, right? I'm flashing the V for victory, right? <laughs> Virus and victory. And, uh, and they're, they're waving back and we're smiling at each other. So there's this apartness physically, but also this sense of, yeah, we're, we're in this and we're doing this and we're going to do it. Yeah, I, I totally echo that. There's sort of a solidarity. Like I was listening to uh, the prime minister's address almost every day for a few days. And, and it really felt like what I can only imagine it felt like for people that were in World War II where um, you know, people were coming together and we all knew we were in the same boat. And I think in, in, in relation to bipolar disorder and anxiety, I guess my message is that um, this is, it may not be comfortable. People may be struggling and suffering, but um, it's normalizing it. And I think it, in, if, if anything, it's allowing people who normally never really understood it, have some understanding and empathy of it. Um, and so the neurotypicals, as you were saying, are getting a taste of it a bit. And not that I would wish that upon anybody, um, but I think that it's, it's also getting uh, more attention and recognizing where the gaps are. And so ideally we'll be having a chance to find where access points are uh, having speed bumps and will be able to better serve people who are already in need and prepare for potential further need and stuff. And so I think it's, I, I think the fact that how you were saying we come together that we've had in our healthcare system, physical health and mental health will be separately. I think that's beginning to come together and be seen as one, because as we take care of our physical health with the virus, we're also knowing that we have to take care of our mental health as well. And so I think uh, as much that, that that's actually a, a good thing that we're starting to see that the, the two have to come together and we need to address both. And, and as you've seen webinars like these, they're, they're coming out and uh, they're becoming more available. And I think that that's a good thing. So you're describing it as an opportunity for healthcare system transformation as a result of this as well. That's what, that would be a paper, yeah. <laughs> The title of a paper we yeah. need to make that happen yeah and, uh, and just to feel that you're not alone in this like this is yeah. this is something that is uh it's okay to feel these things that we are yeah and that's the sense i get from looking at the chat box from people on the line that there is uh, some utility and creating spaces like this to come together in one way that we can safe safely yeah. I want to thank you both as um, our speakers. Um, you did an incredible job. I'm very honored to work with you. And we'll just round out by pointing our audience members to a few more resources and tools um, to keep you going until the next time we get together. We mentioned in our first event that we have a bipolar wellness center. Uh, that's where we house all our self-management um, tools and resources across different life areas, some of which we've talked about today, exercise, sleep, uh, relationships. In addition to that, I wanted to mention that we have a quality of life tool, um, which you can take. It's designed specifically for people with bipolar disorder, and it allows you to measure how you're doing in different life areas. We talked about the importance of measurement a few times today, of you know, being a scientist about the impact of what you're doing on, um, on your well-being. So that's one way for you to do that. 
In addition to that, we have our academic CRESPD website, and this is where you can learn more about the different research projects we have going on. Our biggest one at the moment is Bipolar Bridges, which is a digital health uh, study. And we have um, a study that's recruiting right now for healthcare providers who work with people with bipolar disorder and people with bipolar disorder. And that's about um, what's working for you in terms of um, online applications and mobile, mobile apps um, to support your health and quality of life. So it just takes five minutes or so. It'd be amazing if you could participate in that and support our research if you fall into those two categories. And then finally, just to let you know that that website, the CRESPD Home website is where you also hear about our upcoming events. Our next one is planned for April 16th, which is next Thursday. It's gonna be starring uh, Fiona Lobin from the Spectrum Center in Lancaster. And for that one, we're gonna be focusing on family life, family dynamics during these times. That's gonna be happening at seven o'clock UK time, uh, which is 11 o'clock for us here in the Pacific uh, zone and two o'clock Eastern. So with gratitude, oh, and you can also access the previous um, recordings from these events. I forgot about that slide at the same place. And then finally, just to thank our funders who support our work, uh, most notably the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And uh, just a couple of minutes ahead of time to leave you with the places that you can go to find out more about our work or seek information online or through our social media platforms. Huge thank you to everybody who joined us today uh, for the excellent questions that came through, and most notably to Rob and Victoria for the expertise that they shared. You did a lovely job and I really appreciate you both. Thanks. Thank you very Thanks much. Being here. A pleasure and a privilege. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Great seeing you there. Until next week, everybody, stay safe. Bye.